This is Bishop Dale Broder. Thank you so much for joining our YouTube channel today. If this is a blessing to you, I want to encourage you to like it and then click the subscribe button and then turn on notification. Hit that little notification bell so that you never ever miss another one of our videos. And then if you're in the Metro Atlanta area on a Sunday, check out one of our exhilarating services at 8.30 a.m., 11 a.m., or 6 o'clock p.m. Well, if you want to turn your attention, Luke chapter 9, verse 51 and, uh, through verse 56 in the New Living Translation, notice these words. As the time drew near for him to ascend to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. He sent messengers ahead to a Samaritan village to prepare for his arrival. But the people of the village did not welcome Jesus because he was on his way to Jerusalem. And when James and John saw this, they said to Jesus, Lord, should we call down fire from heaven to burn them up? But Jesus turned and rebuked them. And so they went to another village. And I simply want to speak today from the subject, turn the page. Turn the page. They were ready to call down fire from heaven because somebody rejected them. Listen, let me put it to you this way. Don't let five bad minutes of your day ruin your whole day. Just keep it moving. Just turn the page. You got something that's a nightmare on one page? Turn the page. Keep reading the story. Maybe something good will happen. Just turn the page. Turn the page. Just get out of that chapter. Turn the page. You're not locked in it. You can turn the page. You have the freedom to turn the page. I want you to notice something. Put verse 51 back up there again. Uh, notice this where it says, And Jesus, as the time drew near for him to ascend to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. He resolutely set out for Jer uh, Jerusalem. See, Jesus did this as he saw the time drawing near for him to ascend to heaven. This is to say to us that the closer that you get to your time to go to heaven, the more resolute that you become about where you're going and about what you're doing. I mean, when, the closer that you get to heaven, you ain't got time for foolishness. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, when heaven is in your view, you don't have time for the foolishness of this world. This says the closer that he knew that the time for him to go to heaven, the more resolute he resolutely set himself to go. He set himself. Uh, this, this resolute mindset of Jesus here was about his journey. When, when it said that he was resolute, it meant that he was not going to be deterred. It meant that he was not going to quit. It meant that he was made up where he was going, no matter what happened to him or who would leave him on the journey or who would join him on the journey. Jesus had already made up his mind. Listen, if you don't go, I'm going. Because I, I don't know about you, but I'm not going to hell for anybody. I don't care how cute they are. I don't care what all they have going on for them. I'm not going to hell for anybody. For anybody. I've already resolutely set up my mind. I'm not going to hell. For anybody. At any time. I don't care who goes there. I, I, I read a little meme this week. And it, it showed a person, uh, you know, in heaven asking God. Saying, God, can my cousin come up this weekend from, from, from hell and spend the night? And it showed God looking at him and saying, get out. <laughs> and I so understand that. You, you got to be resolute in where you're going. Jesus set his mind resolutely to go to Jerusalem because he knew that he didn't have that much longer on the earth. He had already determined ahead of time. When you're resolute, you have already made a decision up front what you will allow to deter you from getting to your destination. You've already made that. You've, you've said, no matter if I go through storms, if somebody dies on me, I'm still going all the way. I'm not going to lose my faith. Uh, it, it, it was his way of saying, 
I'm going to endure this. No matter what challenges that I find on the course, I am going to stay the course. I will not be dissuaded. I will not be deluded. I will not be deterred. I have resolutely set my mind, no matter how long it takes, I have set my mind resolutely to go to Jerusalem. And so he was determined to go there because purpose drew him there. Purpose drew him there. And so on your journey... There will be certain things on your journey. There will be certain things on your journey. There will be detours. There will be detours on your journey. Things that you just didn't see coming. And you don't know that there's a detour until you're on the road. And then you see a sign that says detour. The map doesn't normally have a detour already built into it. Your GPS system normally doesn't have a detour already on that telling you to go another way you don't realize that there's a detour until you're on the journey these are what I would call unexpected interruptions that can cost you time and money detours detours where something happened and you have to go around it you have to circumvent some some issue some event some repair work that's going on so uh, on your journey there will be detours then there will be delays no matter how well you try to plan your trip out. And you say, you know what? The, the, the GPS says that it'll take us six hours and 23 minutes to get there. But they don't know how many times your children are going to stop and ask to use the bathroom. <laughs> and, and it doesn't have to be your children. You can get a certain age. Once my father reached a certain age, he had a way of asking a question, but he was making a statement. He was said, does anybody have to use the bathroom? <laughs> he was really saying, I need to stop. I'm at that age now where my bladder sends me, you know. So that's what he was saying. He wasn't asking whether anybody needed to go. He was making a statement saying, I need to stop to use the bathroom. See, and so sometimes that can be a delay. Uh, delays are what I, I call the unanticipated events that are beyond our uh, control that generally cost us time. Traffic is one of those. I mean, you know, any time of day now on 285, any time of day on 20 75 85 you know and I'm like where are you going why are you not at work where are you where are you headed to where are you coming from where are you going at this Do, does anybody have a regular job anymore I mean this rush hour just seems to be all day any time of day 10 o'clock in the morning one o'clock in the afternoon I mean just all time of day just is everybody driving for uber and lyft I mean what Detours. On your journey, there will be detours. On your journey, there will be delays. On your journey, there will be distractions. Uh, the most tempting distractions are those things that you can do, but you're not called to do. Distractions. The things that you can do, that you have the potential, the ability to do, but you're not called to do. This is the difference between good works and God works. Good works are nice things that God didn't call you to do specifically. So uh, that can be a distraction. And, and the devil gets so many people off of their course from reaching their journey through distractions. But Jesus didn't let detours, delays, nor distractions stop him because his mind was resolute. The, third, the fourth thing is disappointments. You will have disappointments. These are the frustrating things that attempt to discourage you from finishing your journey. Just disappointments. You know, there are different things that happen on this journey called life that you didn't expect to. You get a diagnosis. Somebody that was with you dies. You get disappointed. Somebody that you were raising and then they go off track and their life gets messed up and then they're acting like they have lost their minds. And these are disappointments and these are things that are just trying to discourage you from reaching the God place of destiny where he's called you. But Jesus had set his mind resolutely. He'd set it resolutely. But also not only are there detours and delays and distractions and disappointments, but there are also delights. These delights, these are, are what I call the hidden blessings that God has planted on your journey as little reminders that I am with you. Have you ever just been delighted by God? Well, you've been in a situation where, Lord, I can't take any more. I can't take any more. And then God sends a delight your way. Just a little something. Just a little something, something. Just to bless you. Just to, to remind you, I am with you. I've got you. I see you. You steal my boo. I, I still care for you. And, 
And, and, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm walking with you on this journey. He'll send you little blessings. These are what I call delights. So on your journey, you'll have detours and you'll have delays and you'll have distractions and you'll have disappointments. But there are some delights. And God gives enough delights just to become a, a vitamin B injection. To give you a shot in the arm just when you thought you couldn't go another step. I'm so glad about the delights that God plants along the journey so that it doesn't make the journey just totally unbearable. And this one thing, as Jesus was, it's one thing to be rejected by a person, but Jesus re was rejected by a whole town. He was, a, a whole village of Samaritans rejected him. Now you're talking about, you know, you can get a complex from one person rejecting you. I mean, there can be a, a hundred people that'll say nice things about you, and then one person will say, why you wear your hair like that? And, and you, you have forgotten about all of the other hundred compliments and you let one person's little critique that came from a twisted mindset of somebody who's unhappy with themselves, who have projected their negativity on you. And now you're saying, I know, why does she have to say that about my hair? What's the matter? And now you're in the mirror trying to look at your hair in the drugstore trying to get some special conditioner. <laughs> Jesus was not just rejected by one person, a whole village rejected him. What do you do when the whole town tells you, we don't, we don't want nothing you have to sell to us? And I know that's a double negative and it, it causes internal consternation to my, you know, grammatical lexicon on the inside. <laughs> to even say that, this just pains me. But these Samaritans, these were the despised cousins of the Jews anyway. And they rejected Jesus. And sometimes people won't like you just because of the people group that you've come from. No matter how much good you're trying to do to help them. This is where Jesus was. They just had an issue with him because he was a Jew and they were the Samaritans. And the whole village rejected Jesus. And Jesus didn't spend all of his time trying to convince people who were already hell-bent on misunderstanding anything that he had to say. You don't waste your time trying to convince people who are already bent on misunderstanding you, twisting your words and still not liking you at the end of the day. But the good news is that you never judge the potential of your destiny by your history. You never, ever judge the potential of your destiny by your history. Suppose Jesus had judged his success by this one Samaritan village that rejected him. I mean, a whole town rejected him. But go not to the people that, that just tolerate you. Go to the places that celebrate you. you can go, he went to another town and the people celebrated him and he healed all that were sick. And they celebrated him. That's why you got to turn the page. Because somebody is desperately in need of what you carry. And what blesses one, another people have no appreciation of. Because they cannot see your value. But just because they cannot see your value does not diminish your worth. You still carry it for the people to whom you are intended to bless. And that's why if you get rejected in one situation, in one town, in one period of time, turn the page. Don't let a, a bend in the road become the end of the road for you. It's just a bend in the road. You have to turn the page. I want you to notice what it says here in Luke 9.52. He sent messengers ahead to a Samaritan village to prepare for his arrival. Jesus didn't just haphazardly stop by Samaritan, uh, Samaria. He knew the history of the Samaritans. So he sent uh, messengers ahead to prepare for his coming. You see, rarely is the place where you start also the place where you're designed to stay. Rarely. Is the place where you start also the place where you're designed to stay? So Jesus sent messengers ahead to a Samaritan village to prepare for his arrival. You know, in other words, this says to us, plan for where you're going. Plan for where you are going. Plan for where you're going. And, and my question to you is this. Are you sending messages ahead or messengers ahead of your journey? 
of where you intend to go. You have to send messengers. I mean, the moment that you enroll in school, you have to send messengers ahead of you. I mean, the minute that I, I, I went to college, I said, you know what, I'm graduating in four years. I sent a message four years ahead to say, you know, four years coming, ready or not, here I come. I'm coming out, you'll not get another dime. I, I will not be overdue. I'm not going to waste my parents' money. I'm not going to waste my time. I'm not going to waste the scholarship money that I have. I'm coming out in four years. Guess what? I came out in four years. I, declare, I sent a message ahead when I was 18 years old. I sent a message ahead and said that I'm going to marry the minute that I get out, get out of school. The same year when I got out of school, I married. I sent a message ahead. You have to send messages of where you're going. You have to send messages to say, I'm coming through this. You have to send messages when the doctors give you a bad report to say, I'm coming out of this. I'm on my road to recovery. I'm getting up every day. I'm exercising. I'm eating right. You have to send messages ahead of where you're coming. You have to say, listen, you better get ready. You better get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready. Send messages ahead of where you're going. If Jesus did it, how much more do we have to send messengers ahead of where we intend to go, letting them know, I'm coming after you. I'm coming after you, success. I'm coming after you being blessed. I'm coming after you being able to touch the world and make a difference and, and fulfill my purpose. I'm coming after you. Send the messages there that I will not be stopped. Send the message that healing is flowing to me. Send the message that God is prospering me. That angels are going before me, preparing my way and drawing favor along me. Send messages ahead of wherever you intend to go. Jesus did it. And, and here's my, my, my question to you. That if God were to grant you all of the things that have come out of your mouth, what would your life look like? I mean, just think about that. There all of the stuff that you've said. All the kind of crazy stuff that you said. If God were to grant you all the things that have come out of your mouth, what would your life look like? Jesus said you have what you're saying. What if God granted you every idle word that you spoke? What would your life look like? You know, he said in Job chapter 22 and verse 28, notice, you will also declare a thing and it will be established for you. So light will shine on your ways. Notice, a thing declared shall be established. When you decree something, when you say something, you begin to establish something. So there's a power in your spoken word. That's why Jesus sent messengers ahead of him of where he was going to begin to prepare the way. Now listen, if Jesus made a plan for where he was going, what makes you think you don't have to? God himself makes plans. Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans uh, that I've prepared for you. Plans that I have for you. God makes plans. If God makes plans, why don't you think you have to? A plan is a guide for daily execution. It is a guide for daily execution. This is a plan of something that I've, I've got to do. You can't have a dream and goals without a plan. A plan helps you to execute. It says, this is what I've got to do today because you have a plan. You have to have a plan for business to work. It's called a business plan. You're going to have a plan. What do I do? It's a daily guide for execution. You see, a plan is a reliable system for being able to make progress. It's a reliable system to be able to make progress. And what most people call plans are really just wishes. But without a plan, you're just hoping. And hope is not a strategy. Hope is not a strategy. Well, I didn't, I, Lord, I, I've been praying about it. I hope everything will work out. <laughs> hope is not a strategy. Hope is not, I, well, I hope I find somebody. Hope is not a strategy. Here's the deal. You must have uncommon practice if you want uncommon results. So you have to have a plan. You must have uncommon practice if you want uncommon results. Because a plan helps you to commit yourself fully to everything that you want to see done in your life. And I want you to realize that a plan does not work unless you work and have clarity of purpose. A plan does not work unless you do. And you have to have clarity of purpose. Clarity. My friend Sergio Ornung from Lima, Peru said that a dream in your heart without a plan in your mind will never produce a harvest in your hand. You got to have a plan. Notice, uh, 
Luke 9, 53. But the people of the village did not welcome Jesus because he was on his way to Jerusalem. He wasn't welcome because of where he was going. Do you know when you're headed to certain places in life that you're not going to be welcome with other folks who are not trying to go anywhere? Because you're having plans and your face being set resolutely on a certain place begins to judge their immobility. And they hate you for no other reason than where you're going. She thinks she all that. And, and you know, then they want to drag you back to me. I know where she came from. She came from, she, she grew up right down the street from me. She come out, and now she done changed. She been talking about an accent now. I know where she came from. <laughs> people will hate you for where you're headed. They said that these people, they didn't welcome Jesus, not because of what he looked like, not because of something that he did, not because of something that he said, but because he was on his way to Jerusalem. They didn't accept him. They didn't welcome him because of where he was going. And some people just hate you because of where you came from. Others will hate you for where you're going. They rejected Jesus, not because of what he had to say to them, how he said it, but just because of where he was going. You know, when I used to deliver newspapers growing up, um, inevitably that would be, uh, and I was doing it on, I, I, I started out doing it on foot. You know, you, you make progress. And then I started doing it on a bicycle. And then I started doing it on my motorcycle. <laughs> and, and inevitably that, that, that would be houses that I would pass by. And at this time, you know, in communities, you know, we, we didn't have laws about restraining your animal. So dogs <laughs> would, would come out barking at me. Woo, 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 you, you know, I just, and I knew the houses where these dogs would just, just do their sneak attack. Just come up and just start woofing. But you know, I had to do this every day. So I, I was not, I, listen, you don't have time. To respond to every barking dog. I was there to deliver my newspaper so I could go and collect my money. I was on assignment. And then I had to go to school. This is before school. You know, my daddy came from the old school. He, he came up the rough side of the mountain. And he had six sons and he wasn't about to give us anything. My daddy never gave us an allowance. An allowance? That was his money. <laughs> I'm like daddy we rich no 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 he's I'm rich <laughs> but I never took the time to get off of my bicycle or my motorcycle to try to deal with a barking dog because I knew they were going to be there the next day barking and I wasn't going to try to say shh it's just me. You should know me by now. Shh. Don't, don't waste time having a conversation. It's their nature. It's their nature. You don't have time to reason with every barking dog. It is their nature. Some folks are just always going to have something to say. Woo, woo, woo. But I want you to understand this principle that whoever, whoever rejects you is not relevant to your destiny. Whoever rejects you. They couldn't stop Jesus just because they rejected him. They didn't stop him from being Lord and Savior of the whole world. They didn't stop him just because they rejected him. So God will never put your destiny in the hands of other human beings who reject you to give them more power over your destiny than you do. In other words, when you say yes to God, no one's no can stop you. When you say yes to God, no one's no can stop you. And that makes a, who, a, a whole difference. You know, sacrifice differentiates those who are involved with you from those who are committed to you. Sacrifice. And this is why Jesus made a statement, you know, about communion. And the folks eating his flesh and drinking his blood. You remember that in, in, in St. John chapter 6, 
verse 6 through 6 to 7, here's where Jesus gets rejected again. Because you think that you're the only one who deals with rejection. Notice Jesus. Many of his disciples, many, many, you know, does it say a handful? Many, many of his disciples said, this is very hard to understand. How can anyone accept it? Now, except what? Jesus just said to them, except you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part of me. And they said, this, you, you know, Jesus, you know, I ain't in no cannibalism. You're talking about some strange voodoo type of stuff. I, I, Jesus told them, something. they said, this is very hard to understand. How can anyone accept it? Verse 61, Jesus was aware that his disciples were complaining. You're always aware when people are complaining. So he said to them, does this offend you? He says, then what will you think if you see the Son of Man ascend to heaven again? The Spirit alone gives eternal life. Human effort accomplishes nothing. And the very words I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But some of you do not believe me. For Jesus knew from the beginning which ones didn't believe. And he knew who would betray him. And then he said, that is why I said that people can't come to me unless the Father gives them to me. And at this point, many of his disciples turned away. Did it say a handful? Many of his disciples turned away and deserted him. And then Jesus turned to the twelve and asked, are you also going to leave? I mean, this, he's having a fierce conversation. He says, Look, this, I, I need committed people to me. I need to know who is with me. I need to know who's with me. Listen, here's a word to the wise. I see so many people that are so concerned about trying to get somebody who can hang with them, somebody that can chill with them. Don't get somebody that you can chill with. Get somebody that you can build with. You need to get somebody that is committed to say, you know what? I, I need somebody who's going to roll up their arm. I mean, anybody, anybody can ride with you in the limo. But will they help you to be able to build the organization? Will they help you to build a family? Will they help you to get up and get children dressed? And to help wash clothes and to help, you know, run a vacuum, you know? You know, I, I mean, I had a man that told me, he said, I run everything in my house. The wash machine, the dishwasher, the vacuum cleaner. It's amazing. But I'm so grateful to God. I'm so grateful. And this is why you have to understand from the beginning, never confuse those who are attached to you with those who are assigned to you. Because there are some people that God has assigned to your life and those that are assigned to you will never forsake you. They won't walk off from your life and turn away and never walk with you again. There are other people that are attached to you for what you can do for them. And when you no longer serve that purpose for them, they're no longer committed to you. And they weren't ever committed to begin with. To tell the truth, they were self-serving. They were never in your corner to begin with. And so sometimes trouble is one of God's great gifts to us to be able to reveal the real nature that's in a human being. To just expose folks that were never with you. They were attached and not assigned. Because those that are assigned to you, you cannot offend them. To the degree that they will walk away from you and never come back. Amen. And so sometimes you just have to turn the page so that you can move on to the next chapter of your life. To move your, to your next chapter, you've, you've got to have somewhere to go. Now some people just don't know how to give it up. You've got to have somewhere to go. And then you've got to have someone to go with with whom you enjoy. Whether it's a spouse, whether it's a friend. You've got to have somebody. You don't want to just go by yourself. You're going to have somebody that you can go with that you enjoy. And then you have to have something to do. That's why some people can't leave. They can't give it up. They, and they do it until they die. Because they, 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 you've got to have somewhere to go. You've got to have somebody to go with that you enjoy. And then you've got to have something to do. You've got to have something to do. But let me just prophesy to you and tell you that your next chapter is going to be amazing. Your next chapter is going to be amazing. And I find people, I find people that will tell me, you know, well, I finally had the strength to move out. Just because you moved out does not mean that you have moved on. And sometimes you got to be convinced to say, you know what, I'm going to turn the page. I am going to turn the page. I'm going to move on to my place of destiny. I'm going to move on to my next assignment. I finish this particular dimension. And you do, when you walk with God, you can fight a good fight. You can keep the faith. You can finish your course. And when you finish one course, as long as you have breath, the, 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 the question, if you're asking, do I have another course? Blow on the back of your hand. And if you can feel that. 
It means that you've got another course. You're not finished yet. If you can do that, as long as there's breath in you, as long as there's a wisdom of God in you, as long as there's a counsel in you, my God, don't, don't let a bald head or a gray head just waste away into oblivion. They have the great resources of wisdom and encouragement and perspective and judgment and counsel that can so bless your life in immeasurable dimensions and shorten your learning curve. So they're a gift to you. They're a gift. They're a gift. They are a gift. And so once you, once you desire progress more than you do convenience and acceptance, there's no obstacle that can stop you. But it will only motivate you to what God has called you to do. So stop using the excuse because I've, 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 I've said things to people and then they'll tell me, well, you know, that's easier said than done. Everything is easier said than done. <laughs> What's not easier said than done? It's always I just husband love your wife. It's just easier said than done. It's easier said than done. <laughs> Children obey your parents. It's easier said than done. That's so many. Just because it's easier said than done, don't let that be an excuse for you not to do what God has called us to do. The past should never be a prison, but it should be that that gives you your perspective. The past gives you perspective. The greatest value of the past is as a teacher. It is a teacher. Don't let it be a prison. Don't let it lock you into a dimension because you are a growing thing. You are a living thing. You are an adaptable thing. You are a flexible thing that God has built you to be able to adapt to whatever kind of situation. If you lost a leg, if you lost an arm, if you lost a spouse, if you lost a child, God has built you with a resilience to be able to come back in a different dimension and still keep living and serving the purpose that God placed you in the earth to do. Even though your assignment may change, but when this has, has finished here, Turn the page. Turn the page. Read another chapter. Don't, don't get stuck in the nightmare of one chapter. Turn the page. Just turn the page. Turn the page. You, if, if, if you're in a, in a position, in a phase that you don't like, just keep turning. Keep living. Keep being diligent. Keep being faithful. Just keep turning the page. Keep turning the page. And you, you just watch what God will do. Just watch what God will do. But God will do some amazing things. And if you feel like you're losing everything... I want you to just remember the tree that loses its leaves every year and it still stands tall waiting for better times to come. And in another season, it knows that new leaves are going to come. Leaves go and leaves come. And the new leaves cannot come unless the old leaves go you stand as a tree the planting of the Lord because God wants to still grow things as long as you are connected to the vine that is one of the blessings of the scripture in Psalm 92 that they that be planted in the house of the Lord shall be fat and flourishing that's a sign of prosperity and health and stuff now that's that you're going to be doing well you know not just feeble and petering out but God says you're going to be doing well and that you will still bring forth fruit in your old age you're going to still be able to be productive so you never stop you never stop you never give up there was a uh, the, the story is told of the young man that uh, was about to graduate from high school and uh, and, and he was so excited about uh, his life he's actually about to graduate from college and and he, he he knew that his father was a fairly affluent man and and he had dropped so many hints that he wanted this sports car down at this dealership because he'd taken his dad there and he just was drooling over it and, and, and he just was assured that his daddy was going to get him without him saying anything about it. And upon graduation, his father brought him into his study and he said, son, you know that I love you and I'm so proud of you. I'm so desperately proud of you and I've got something for you. And he handed him a box. And in this beautifully wrapped box with a beautiful bow on it, the son excitedly begins to unravel the bow and opens the box. And there he discovers in it a Bible with his name embossed in gold. And he just put the top on his, put the paper back over it, was disgusted, yelled at his daddy, 
and walked out of the house and never spoke to his father again. He went on and became fairly successful in life, had his own family. And one day it dawned on him, you know what, I ought to call that old man. And before he could pick up the phone to call the old man, a call came to him that his old man had gone. And that he needed to come home, he said, because his old man had left him everything. And as he was at home in his daddy's office, going through some of his papers, he found that box that his daddy had given him. And he opened it up. He opened that Bible and his dad had put a marker there in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 11. That if ye being evil know how to good give, give good gifts to your children, how much more does your heavenly father know? And he, and he read that scripture. He read that scripture. And he turned a few pages and he noticed that a key fell out of the back of the Bible. And it had a tag on it with the dealer's name and the date of his graduation and marked on the tag said paid in full. And there he had been blessed by his own father, but lived in acrimony and bitterness all of those years only because he failed to turn the page. What might be waiting on you? Maybe God has something, I'm just telling you. But I feel that the greatest day of the church is not behind us, but it's ahead of us. Because I read somewhere in the scripture about the former house and the latter house. And the glory of the latter house exceeded that of the former house. And if God is going to bless you with joy, I want to have more joy at 85 than I had at 5. I want to have fullness of life where I really understand what it means and I really understand the meaning of a blessing. And when you, uh, you have to get some age on you because when I was young, I used to hear old people testify and say, Lord, I thank you that I, I woke up this morning with my right mind. I, I didn't know what they were talking about. I'm like, I wake up with my right mind every day. But just keep living. And then they were saying the use and the activity of my limbs. And, and them really country folks, they would say, Lord, I thank you that my bed was not my, my cooling slab. And my sheets were not my, my winding cloth. Oh my God, it's like they were talking in some type of hieroglyphic code to me. I, I didn't even understand what they were talking about, but they were just saying, you know, that when you reach a certain age, you realize that every day that you have is a gift. You, you, you own grace. We, we, we got three score and ten and... And it's a great day every day that I'm alive and feel pretty good and in my right mind, Lord, I thank you, Lord, I thank you. I give you glory and honor and majesty and dominion. Just turn the page. Just turn the page. Better days, better days. And I declare in the name of Jesus that he'll give you time with your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren, that God will bless you. Let, let me I just declare to you that your next is going to be greater than your ex. Your next is going to be greater than your ex. Your next is going to be greater than your ex. Your next is going to be greater than your ex. I declare it in the name of Jesus. Your next job, your next business, your next dream, your next kingdom assignment, your next is going to be greater than your ex. Your next school that you deal with, your next business deal, the next property that you sell, the next endeavor that you deal with, your next book, your next song, your next album, your next, your next is going to be greater than your ex. I declare it in the name of Jesus. Better opportunities, better sanity, better judgment, better favor of God, better health, better understanding, better clarity of mind. I declare in the name of Jesus that your next is going to be greater than your ex. You are wiser now than you've ever been all the days of your life. You are stronger now than you've ever been all of the days of your life. I decree it and declare it in the name of Jesus. Your next is going to be greater than your ex. No matter who left you, the people that God is bringing into your life, new alignments, new relationships, new opportunities, new deals, new visions, new dreams, new thinkings, new mindsets, new tool sets, new skill sets, new mindsets. I declare in the name of Jesus, God's got something brand new for you. Yes, he does. He is not finished. He is not finished. He is not finished. Don't you 
you dare die in the place where you're supposed to be delivered? Turn the page! 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 God is writing an epic in your life! This is that that Joel the prophet prophesied about. When he said the spirit of the Lord is going to come and your sons and your daughters. My God, I'm excited about it. When the world loses their mind, I'm excited that there is a remnant of the people of God that will rise up and your seed shall not see corruption. That great shall be the peace and the composure of your sons and your daughters, your seed, your ancestry, your offspring that's coming after you. I decree it. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, they shall have great peace and composure and they shall be taught of the Lord. What you have produced will become the devil's worst nightmare. My God, I'm excited about it today. I'm excited about what Jesus is doing. Your next is greater than your ex. Your next is greater than your ex. Your next is greater. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah to the Lamb. Thank we hope that you enjoyed that message. Don't forget to like and subscribe and then press the notification bell so that you don't miss another one of our videos. And if you want to partner with us, click the Give Now button. Thank you for what you do.